Okay, well, I think we'll, let's do this now. So I'll, I'll say next and you advance, okay? And, and uh, the advancement, just push any button? Uh, to push the right button. The, the, the right, right one. The right arrow, yes. The right arrow, okay. Okay. Is this good for everyone? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of confusion about uh, meltdown inspector and what that, what the implications are for various kinds of security. Uh, oh, this is completely open. Uh, uh, this is yeah, no inhibition at all. Um, uh, okay, so. There's been a lot of confusion about Meltdown Inspector. There's been like, blog, public blog posts with uh, titles like uh, The End of Language Based Security, uh, Frozen Realms, of course, is about language based security. Um, uh, so I want to address some of, some of the confusion and clear up some things. Um, next. Uh oh. Can people read that? Oh, good. Good, good, good. So people can read that. So, uh, for many things in security, for a surprisingly large number of things in security, you can find this three-way taxonomy to break down issues. Um, there's uh, the issue that, um, depending on the various communities, um, uh, is um, essentially known as safety or integrity or consistency. Program correctness people like to talk about safety and consistency. Security people like to talk about integrity. But uh, essentially what I mean by that here is only authorized actions or effects happen and um, <coughs> programs are able to maintain their invariants, the invariants are not corrupted, uh, and uh, they can um, provide correct service to correct clients. The clients that, for example, satisfy precondition and abstraction can maintain its invariants and maintain it to satisfy postcondition. So basically, uh, at the level of what happens, you can write programs, uh, and you can write programs that continue to do this despite malicious behavior within, within the same address space, within the same language, uh, if you're in a language-based security system. Um, then there's uh, liveness or availability of progress. So the, sorry, I, should, I should be clear about the correct under integrity, correct clients do not get bad service. But that doesn't mean they get any service. It means that any service they get is correct. And then, um, and then liveness or availability or progress, once again, depending on what community you're talking to, uh, is basically that uh, actions or effects continue to happen. Uh, and that uh, abstractions um, uh, are able to continue to provide good service. Uh, to their clients. Why does it keep doing that? Is that my laptop? The, um, oh, okay, in any case, it's kind of on the hands. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who's computer doing hangouts? Yeah, it's not a And then finally, there's the there's the issue that is of most concern with regard to Spectre and Meltdown, uh, which is confidentiality or privacy or secrecy, once again, depending on the community. Uh, but it's basically that secret information uh, that's not feasible to infer it. Um, uh, 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 information that you shouldn't have access to should not be inferable from information that you do have access to. Uh, and confidentiality needs to be further broken down into overt versus side versus covert channels. Um, uh, the first breakdown is overt versus non-overt, where both side and covert are considered non-overt. Uh, overt means that it's part that the communication is guaranteed to happen according to the language commander. So when object A invokes object B, passing it information, that's an overt communication. Um, 
when uh, when information is inferred through activities that are not part of the specification, that are leaked through things that happen to be properties of the implementation, that's a sign or a covert channel. And the only difference between sign and covert is intentionality. Uh, sign is accidental leakage by the leaker, and covert is a confined leaker that wants to leak information uh, to a co-conspirator that he's not supposed to communicate. Next. Okay, so the dependencies between these things are important, which is, in general, a good architecture, um, uh, in a good architecture, integrity should not depend on availability. That's the, what I mean by bang right now, is should not depend on. Um, uh, local integrity, uh, which is generally what we're thinking about when we're thinking about language-based security, uh, should not depend on confidentiality, and generally does not. Um, but distributed integrity uh, must depend on cryptographic protocol, distributed meaning over open networks, and uh, cryptographic protocols depend on cryptographic secrets. So that's a uh, irreducible way in which integrity depends on secrecy. Um, uh, wideness, um, uh, uh, availability, uh, the, the realistically always depends on integrity because if you lose integrity, then whatever you try to do to preserve availability is lost. Uh, availability does not depend on confidentiality. Uh, and finally, confidentiality um, uh, 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 in general depends on integrity. Uh, and then the key thing is with regard to covert channels and side channels, which are the issue with meltdown and specter, um, confidentiality also depends on availability and it depends on timing and other non-determinism through which uh, the implementation can leak information that a computation can use to, um, uh, to infer information it should not have access to. Um, okay, next. Okay. Granularity is important. When we talk about language-based security, we're generally talking about uh, objects within an address space. In the JavaScript context, uh, we're talking about objects sharing an event loop and therefore part of one sequential flow of control, um, whereas processes uh, proceed concurrently with each other. Um, so safety, integrity, and consistency apply with no problem down to object granularity and when you apply them down in object regularity, that's when they apply beautifully. That's when a lot of our language-based formalisms start talking about invariance and preconditions and postconditions, that we can take all of that machinery and apply it beautifully when we're defending integrity at the object level. And defending it first at the finest grain means it's much easier to continue to, to defend it at larger grain. Within a single uh, sequential flow of control, it's impossible to defend availability within the process because anybody, any adversary who gets the CPU, who gets the thread, can just go into an infinite loop and deny availability to everything else in that, in that concurrency, in that process. Um, and finally, uh, confidentiality, uh, now we can make the important distinction, which is um, uh, overt confidentiality is perfectly well protected at object granularity by, by language security mechanisms, but covert channels and side channels, um, uh, you, you have to assume that uh, if you're within the same process, um, well, sorry. if a computation has access to timing, measure the duration of time, then it's trivial, even without meltdown and specter, for another computation within the same process to signal it. Because when it gets the CPU, it can just take up varying amounts of time, then release the CPU, and a adversary who can measure time, or a co-conspirator who can measure time, can then just use that to infer uh, the information that, is, that, that uh, one was attempting to communicate. Uh, the big surprise with Meltdown Inspector uh, is that day 
data at rest, data that is not subject to computation, is subject to side channels and is read by side channels. And that's the thing that broke everybody's assumption. The idea that there are side channels that you can't get rid of, and pervert channels you can't get rid of, that's been an assumption in computer security going all the way back to the Orange Book. At the highest level of certification, uh, the Orange Book never demanded zero bandwidth pervert channels or side channels. They demanded an argument, not a proof, but an argument that there was an upper bound on the bandwidth. Um, but everybody missed the possibility even that data at rest, not subject to computation, that is not the active subject of legitimate computation, can then be leaked through, to side, through side channels to programs that cannot address it. Okay, next. So, this is text from the frozen realm proposal. It's been text that's been in there since 2017. Uh, uh, I wrote the text well before I had any inkling that there was anything going on with meltdown inspector. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to read it out loud. Um, uh, even without, without pinning down the precise meaning of implementation defined, a uh, computation that is limited to um, particular kind of determinism that's uh, fail stop implementation defined by determinism, uh, which is defined in greater detail in the documents, that, that definition is still valid. Cannot read covert channels and side channels that, is, that it was not explicitly enabled to read. Nothing can practically prevent signaling on covert channels and side channels, but approximations to determinism can practically prevent confined computation from perceiving these signals. So you know, th this is a reflection of the fact that I've never assumed that there were no side channels or covert channels. And, and, I, and I, the whole frozen realm effort was very careful in the claims that it made, in making claims purely about integrity and to have cautions like this for outside integrity. Next. Okay. Um, so in the Meltdown inspector worst case, where all the mitigations that were trying that everybody's trying to do, let's say, prove to be insufficient, or maybe there's deeper meltdown inspector like problems in the CPU that haven't been identified yet that are even worse. Just for the worst case is basically that within the process, you've got complete transparency, but within the process, the only thing that you have for language-based security strongly with integrity anyway. And integrity is not diminished by meltdown inspector at all with regard to local integrity. Um, uh, for distributed integrity, uh, there's the issue of crypto keys. So Dr. Sess, distributed resilience to your ecosystem, uh, which uh, is a plan of what to build on top of frozen uh, That Those plans have to change because of, of the issue of leaking cryptographic secrets. Handle those cryptographic secrets in a much more careful manner. The frozen realms themselves are just a local mechanism. There's nothing about meltdown inspector that caused this issue. Liveness, once again, is their process. It's hopeless anyway. Nobody, nobody imagines they could, um, they could do anything about that within the process. Um, and for, for confidentiality, um, uh, the frozen realm provides a key enabler. Many libraries that we link into our program, uh, you know, think uh, parser libraries or, or make our you know, linear algebra libraries or all sorts of things are purely computational. The things that they need access to do not include any of the things that would enable them to measure time. And Frozen Realm gives you a very usable mechanism, a mechanism of good ergonomics for uh, bringing in those libraries, giving them what they legitimately need, but denying them all of the resources, like date.now, uh, like um, uh, the ability to um, you know, see the interleaving of messages from post messages, like all sorts of things, deny them the things that they would need in order to measure time, programs as a whole, uh, uh, generally, anything that interacts with the user interacts with the network can therefore measure time. The programs as a whole, Q 
few of them will, will operate under this restriction, but many libraries. Um, okay. Uh, okay, next. And Ethereum <coughs> demonstrates the utility of this purely transparent form of, compute, of computing. Even though um, Meltdown Spectre um, uh, makes things much more transparent than even my worst nightmares, um, uh, and even though I kept any claims about confidentiality as part of the groundwork, there's still the issue of if you can't keep a secret, is it useful to talk about the security? And Ethereum is a demonstration of the utility of strong integrity in the context where there's absolutely zero confidentiality by design. Anything computed on a public blockchain is, is completely open, it's completely indefensible to try to think about keeping a secret of a public public blockchain, but it can still interact with cryptography, in fact it does pervasively, if, where all the cryptographic secrets are kept off chain. Uh, that was about my last slide. Oh, okay. um, uh, but I, I would like to certain, I would like to propose a five minute extension for questions. Okay? Maybe I don't need five minutes for questions. questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah, I hear some questions. Oh, okay. So yeah, who does? Yes. So what is the takeaway for the proposal? Uh, the takeaway for the proposal uh, is that uh, we should have some explicit language uh, explaining that the object encapsulation boundary, uh, you know, being much more clear than the, that text I showed, that the object encapsulation boundary should now be taken only to be reliable as an integrity boundary uh, and to warn people from uh, reading in, uh, in information encapsulation into that integrity, into, that, uh, into the encapsulation boundary of objects. But otherwise it doesn't change anything about the API or the semantics. Oh uh, well, it, so what it changes, it changes the priority. Uh, it means that working on the um, the ergonomics around linking in deterministic libraries in such a way as to ensure that they're really limited to determining them uh, is now a much more pressing issue because that gives you within process defense of confidentiality, which which um, is is essentially impossible for any mechanism otherwise. Okay? So I was actually when playing off that better than the first question, which was uh, I suspect out of this. One of the things that I would like to see as a result of Frozen Realms is an easy way to launch libraries and run them in a deterministic fashion where I can say, you know, this thing's deterministic, let me put it in a box, so now I've represented that and I'm protected from it and I have insurance of that. And so it would be nice to, if there was a, at least, at least usage examples, but it may be direct API support so that it is easy for library providers to do such a thing. Because there's just a lot of libraries that are purely deterministic and there's no reason why they should be in a, in a place where they could embed timer. Yeah. So, so, so the, the uh, ergonomics around around that I think exactly, exactly should it's now much higher priority. Work on that. The other thing that's high priority is to actually go to the list of resources that people might be giving to libraries uh, that enable the timing channels that they don't know about, that they haven't thought about. There's this wonderful paper, uh, fantastic timers, and where to find them of all sorts of bizarre things that you can use in JavaScript uh, inside a browser context uh, to measure time, uh, none of which, so not none of which, uh, anyway, um, classifying those and labeling them um, uh, and, and building the ergonomics around that classification so that people can easily know what is and is not dangerous. Uh, uh, that, that the priority of that goes up as well. Okay, next up, uh, Dan, uh, planning for next I have one, one question, so I found here, I have here one plan, you know, which came with a list of participants, and is 